Hello everyone, my name is Daniela and I'm a volunteer with For a Safer Space. Today's video will be on dissociative disorders. I would like to begin this presentation with a land acknowledgement. I am conducting this presentation on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island. While it is important to acknowledge which land I'm on, it is equally as important to understand why we engage in a land acknowledgement. First, acknowledging the land is an act of decolonization. Decolonization is an act that aims to reverse colonialism. It is also significant in understanding history and acknowledging history, as well as showing respect for indigenous peoples and their relationship to the land. However, it is important to not only use the land acknowledgement, but to educate ourselves on historical and current issues, stand with indigenous peoples in the pursuit of social justice, and decolonize our thoughts and actions. Today's agenda will include a brief introduction into the topic, which will be followed by what are dissociative disorders, types of dissociative disorders, statistics, risk factors, warning signs, comorbidity in dissociative disorders, treatment, misconceptions about dissociative disorders, coping with dissociative disorders, supporting someone living with a dissociative disorder, supporting a client, and finally to wrap up, resources and key takeaways will be discussed. Dissociation is defined as being disconnected from others, the world around you, or from yourself. There are three different types of dissociative disorders, including dissociative identity disorder, depersonalization derealization disorder, and dissociative amnesia. The concept of dissociation, which assists individuals in understanding and coping with traumatic stressors, has a purpose to disconnect someone from reality. Many people experience this in the context of daydreaming or getting lost in a film which result in a disconnection with their awareness of their surroundings. When this is applied to traumatic lived experiences, it may assist someone in moving through the experience that otherwise might pose as a more difficult challenge. Therefore, they may dissociate from their memories, circumstances, or feelings, and may have challenges to remember the experience later on. What are dissociative disorders? Dissociative disorders consist of disconnections around memory, identity, emotion, perception, behavior, and sense of self. Due to this, symptoms can often impact many different ways of functioning as individuals tend to escape reality through unhealthy and involuntary means. This tends to develop due to trauma as it creates a disconnect from traumatic memories. This can be particularly prevalent if traumatic events occur during childhood, as children may have more difficulties understanding what is going on. Symptoms can vary on a scale from amnesia to alternate identities, which is impacted by which type of dissociative disorder an individual has. Often these symptoms can become worse during periods of stress. Post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD is very similar to dissociative disorders with similar symptoms of memory loss, depersonalization, or derealization. Therefore, it is common that the two mental health disabilities get confused. Now we will break down each type of dissociative disorder, including dissociative identity disorder, depersonalization, derealization disorder, and dissociative amnesia. Dissociative identity disorder is connected to overwhelming experiences, traumatic events, and or abuse that happened in childhood. This mental health disability was previously called multiple personality disorder. Symptoms specific to dissociative identity disorders are the prevalence of this leads to separate identities or what is known as personality states. With this, it includes differences in behavior, memory, and thinking, and could be noticed by the individual or those around them. Continuous gaps in memory about everyday events, personal information, or traumatic lived experiences, and symptoms result in significant distress or issues with social, work, or other aspects of functioning. Attitudes or personal preferences, such as foods, activities, or clothing styles, can shift without warning and change back. This change in identity can occur involuntary and unwanted, leading to high levels of stress. Depersonalization derealization disorder consists of ongoing or recurrent experiences with one or both of the following, depersonalization or derealization. Depersonalization includes occurrences of re unreality or detachment from their mind, self, or body. Often this can feel like they're outside of their bodies and watching events as they occur. Derealization is occurrences of unreality or detachment from their surroundings. This can feel as though things and people around them are not real. During these periods, the individual can be aware of reality and that their experience is unusual, which can cause significant distress even though they may not show it and appear as though they are lacking emotion. Symptoms can occur in early childhood, but is most often experienced around the age of 18. In fact, under 20% of those who live with this mental health disability develop symptoms after the age of 20. 
Dissociative amnesia consists of an individual's inability to recall information about themselves, which differs from normal forgetfulness. This is often related to traumatic and distressing events and could be either localized, selective, or generalized. Localized is where the individual has challenges remembering an event or a particular period of time. This is the most common. Selective is where the individual cannot recall a specific aspect of an event or some events within a given time. Finally, generalized is where there is an entire loss of identity and lived experiences. However, this is often rare. Dissociative amnesia is connected to traumatic childhood experiences, specifically with regards to emotional abuse and neglect. Often individuals will have little or no knowledge about their memory or the significance of the memory loss will be minimized. Now we will discuss a few statistics that demonstrate how prevalent dissociative disorders are. When a traumatic event occurs, the prevalence of individuals who will experience dissociative states during or after the event is 73%. Dissociative identity disorder can occur in up to 1% of the population. Women are said to be nine times more likely to develop a dissociative disorder, and some studies suggest that depersonalization derealization disorder is the third most common mental health disability after depression and anxiety. Risk factors. Generally, as mentioned earlier, dissociation is common for coping with extreme stress or trauma, especially within childhood. Experiences can include sexual, physical, or emotional abuse, as well as other traumatic experiences like natural disasters or kidnappings. Due to the role trauma plays in dissociative disorders, individuals of any age, ethnicity, gender, or social background can develop this mental health disability. Thus, risk factors that play the largest role is physical, emotional, or sexual abuse in childhood. While the warning signs can vastly differ based on which dissociative disorder an individual has, there are some warning signs that could hint towards a dissociative disorder. These include memory loss of specific points of time, events, people, or personal information, a feeling of being disconnected from oneself or their emotions, a feeling of people or surroundings around oneself being distorted and unreal, an altered sense of identity, major feelings of stress or issues in relationships, work, or other significant aspects in one's life, challenges with the ability to cope well with emotional stress, and mental health concerns such as depression, anxiety, or suicidal thoughts or behaviors. The next section will discuss comorbidity and dissociative disorders. However, I think it is important to have a foundation of knowledge on what comorbidity is. Comorbidity can be defined as the prevalence of two or more illnesses in the same individual, either co-occurring or one after the other. There can also be an interaction within the illnesses that can negatively impact both. Now that we better understand what comorbidity is, we can discuss its relationship to dissociative disorders. Comorbidities are actually fairly common among individuals living with a dissociative disorder. In fact, in one study, every participant who had a dissociative disorder had another mental health disability. For instance, these included depression, somatization disorder, and borderline personality disorder, which were fairly common in the participants. However, why is this understanding important? The high prevalence of comorbidities often can cause issues for individuals living with dissociative disorders. This is because they often receive a different diagnosis, which means that they do not get the appropriate resources to help them cope. As well, it perpetuates the lack of information and knowledge that exists on this mental health disability. Treatments can differ based on which type of dissociative disorder the individual has but most commonly offered include psychotherapy and medication. Psychotherapy is the most used option as it provides a safe space to discuss the dissociative disorder and other related problems. However, for this it can be significant to find a professional who specializes in working with individuals who have lived experiences of trauma. This will help to understand the cause of the mental health disability and to develop healthy ways of coping with stressful events. Another option is medication. Medication for dissociative disorders in particular do not exist. However, sometimes antidepressants, anti-anxiety, or antipsychotic medications may be prescribed to assist with the symptoms of dissociative disorders. Misconceptions about dissociative disorders. Now we will take a couple minutes to better understand what misconceptions exist. It's important to understand misconceptions as they can perpetuate misinformation, stereotypes, and stigma, which heavily impact individuals living with this mental health disability. The first misconception is dissociative disorders are well understood. The reality is this cannot be farther from the truth. This particular condition can be difficult to diagnose. This can be harmful as individuals often receive incorrect diagnosis, which impacts the resources that are provided. 
Individuals living with dissociative disorders are dangerous. Media often portrays that individuals living with dissociative disorders are dangerous. However, these are not only inaccurate, but can harm those living with the condition. And finally, dissociative disorders are rare. They are not as rare as most individuals think. Many people will experience an episode of depersonalization derealization in their life during traumatic events. In fact, about 1% of the population eventually will develop a dissociative disorder. Coping with dissociative disorders. There are various ways individuals can cope with a dissociative disorder. While not all coping methods will work for everyone due to the vast individuality and differences in individuals' lived experiences, we will discuss a few methods that can be beneficial. The first is to reach out. Reaching out to a trusted individual to discuss experiences can be helpful, as well reaching out to a professional can have its benefits. Therapy is often used as a way to work through difficulties that an individual faces and provides the tools to manage and cope with the condition. Practice grounding yourself. This means to look for ways to be present in the current moment. Some individuals practice deep breathing, think of and recite a poem or song, wash their face with cold water, or may sit with a pet. Focusing on senses can be greatly beneficial, especially for grounding. By running through the senses and labeling different things that an individual can see, smell, touch, hear, or taste can help keep them in the present moment. Exercise. Exercise can be helpful as not only can it positively impact emotional well-being, but physical health as well. While mental health is not entirely dependent on physical health, exercise can have its benefits. And finally, self-care. Self-care can look different to different individuals. However, what's important is that individuals practice compassion and kindness for themselves. There are several ways to support someone living with a dissociative disorder. However, what's key is that the individual centers the needs and wants of the individual when aiming to support. Some ways to support someone includes patience and compassion. This can be shown by asking what would help them and understanding that they may not know in that moment what they need, or listening to them and centering empathy. Help them reach out for professional supports. This can be done through researching resources for professional supports or even going with them to an appointment if it's wanted. Learn about how you can help them stay safe. This includes understanding triggers so that you can help them cope or asking what they need during periods of amnesia, flashbacks, or identity alteration. And finally, what's most important when supporting someone is that the individual looks after their own well-being first. Individuals who offer support can reach out to professionals, take time for themselves, and establish boundaries. Supporting a client. There are a few important aspects for practitioners to consider when working with clients living with associative disorders. This includes self-reflexivity, which is important for a practitioner to be aware of their own relationships to dissociation and trauma. By being self-aware of their own relationships with these phenomena, they can better assist clients with working through their own traumas and leading judgment-free. Assist the client with keeping in the present. By teaching the client how to come back to the present and stay grounded, it can provide tools for managing their symptoms. Small exercises, such as asking them to find three red objects in the room or listen for three sounds, can help keep them grounded during a session and can provide them with tools for when they're no longer with the practitioner. Assist them with coming back to their body. As individuals may dissociate from a physical state, it can help for practitioners to help them connect with their bodies. This can also help them to keep from physical harm as they will have more body awareness. Exercises for this include asking them to push their feet into the floor and notice when they feel movement. And finally, assist them with their different identity alterations. Ensure that practitioners lead with non-judgment with all identities that someone may have. Practitioners can help with creating collaboration and cooperation between the different parts while ensuring everyone is seen. The practitioner should not aim to remove the parts, but work towards cooperation. Now we'll go over resources. The most important thing to take away from this video is that there's supports and help available. For an immediate mental health crisis, reach out to a crisis line for support. For non-immediate mental health support, a useful resource is For a Safer Space. For a Safer Space is a nonprofit that offers accessible and inclusive mental health care. Visit the website for more information if you would like to reach out for support. We will conclude with some key takeaways. Many people experience dissociation, which is defined as being disconnected from others, the world around you, or from yourself. Dissociative disorders consist of disconnections around memory, identity, emotion, perception, behavior, and sense of self. There are three types of dissociative disorders, including dissociative identity disorder, 
depersonalization derealization disorder, and dissociative amnesia. The most significant risk factor for the mental health disability is trauma caused by physical, sexual, or emotional abuse in childhood. There are various warning signs for a dissociative disorder, however, they can differ based on which disorder someone has. Comorbidities are fairly common for individuals living with dissociative disorders, which can lead to misdiagnosis. The main treatment offered is psychotherapy, however, sometimes medications may be prescribed. There are ways to cope with dissociative disorders, but it is most important to show self-compassion and kindness. Individuals can support someone living with a dissociative disorder in various ways, however, it is significant that they look after their own mental well-being. And finally, practitioners can support clients in a few ways, particularly by providing tools for coping with dissociation. That concludes this presentation on dissociative disorders. Thank you for watching.